Foundation. He's gonna be diving into the future of blockchain execution. Welcome, Avi. Is this on? Oh, okay, there we go. Uh, hey, everybody. I'm Avi Zerlo. I'm uh, Chief Product Officer at Nil Foundation. Uh, Nil Foundation was founded in 2018. We've been pioneers of ZK technology ever since. We built the world's first circuit compiler, uh, ZK LLVM, the world's first uh, zero knowledge proof market, and uh, later this year we'll be releasing the world's first uh, ZK sharding L2 for Ethereum. Uh, today I'm going to be talking a little bit about the future of blockchain execution. Uh, and this talk is going to be focused primarily around the EVM. We are at ETH Denver. Uh, we are an EVM chain. And despite what you, know, you may have heard recently, the EVM is just fine. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit about that today. Uh, OK, so to start, uh, some basics. And the first half of this presentation is going to be a little bit more technically focused. If you're like a low-level engineer, it's probably very redundant. Uh, but we're just going to walk through a few of the basics of what, what makes an execution environment, what makes uh, a virtual machine. Um, a virtual machine is essentially a, a software computer that runs on top of physical hardware. Um, and uh, it is able to access the resources of hardware uh, via hypervisor. And it allows developers to build applications and use tools that may not be native to the hardware that they're actually operating over. Um, and, and so virtual machines are, are used um, for pretty much all programming development today. But they're also used uh, for blockchains. And this is where we have uh, the EVM. Um, now, the EVM is essentially the, the rules of the uh, correct state transition of Ethereum, uh, the Ethereum blockchain. Um, it reads byte, the Ethereum bytecode, uh, so Solidity and Yule and, and Viper code gets compiled down through an Ethereum compiler uh, into a bytecode which the EVM can read. Uh, it's a stack-based uh, machine. Uh, it's fully Turing complete, uh, meaning that it can uh, compute and process sort of arbitrary computations. Um, and this is very important for smart contracts, uh, smart contract logic. Um, and uh, uniquely, unlike traditional virtual machines, it's run by thousands of nodes that uh, process this state transition function in lockstep. Um, and this is what gives the Ethereum virtual machine its very unique characteristics of, of global shared state and, and decentralization and so on. Um, now, uh, the state transition is an incredibly important component of the EVM um, or, and of the Ethereum blockchain. It essentially takes the world, and I'm going to flip to the next slide here. It takes the, uh, the current world state, uh, some sort of transaction list. It applies the state transition function, which is essentially the Ethereum virtual machine, and then it computes the resulting world state. And this is how Ethereum builds blocks um, and nodes process this in lockstep, and this is how we, we move the, the blockchain forward. Um, a, a very, another very important part about the uh, Ethereum virtual machine are our opcodes. These are essentially the middle language and instructions that a program can use. Um, uh, because the EVM is a, a standard stack machine, you have typical things that push and, and pop uh, information from the top of the stack. But you also have blockchain-specific operations. Um, and these are things like address that pulls you know, the current address. Uh, bl block hash pulls the last 256, uh, or hash for the last 256 blocks. And every smart contract can be broken down into sort of a series of uh, sequential opcodes, op operations. Um, and in the EVM uses a gas counter to essentially meter the number of operations that a given transaction can use. So a user submits a gas limit, and this sort of caps the amount of opcodes, you could think, um, that uh, that transaction can consume. Um, and there's also sort of a, a limit on 
on a, how much gas a, a certain block can consume, and there's a target of 15 million and so on, but uh, details aren't important for now. Okay, so that was, a, I, that was, thank you for bearing with me. That was some of the technical background and foundation, um, but why is the EVM important? Well, the EVM does pretty much everything. Uh, it touches everything uh, about the Ethereum blockchain. It influences everything that developers do. Um, and this is directly from the EF's website. The Ethereum protocol itself exists solely for the purpose of keeping the continuous, uninterrupted, and immutable operation of the EVM. Uh, so what, what exactly does the EVM touch? It touches the developer experience for uh, smart contracts. It influences the speed at which the blockchain actually progresses. Granted, uh, the execution of, of, of the blockchain is, is sort of a, a minority share uh, compared to consensus. Um, it influences your, your API compatibility and developer tooling compatibility. So uh, things like your developer environment, uh, your wallet support, indexer support, um, these are all influenced by essentially the EVM that you implement. And then it also impacts hardware requirements, um, in particular for Ethereum validators. And here, I'm just going to have a, this is a total side note, but uh, on client diversity, which has sort of been a, a hot topic as of late, you may have heard of some concerns about the execution client uh, concentration risk around Geth. Um, essentially, what this means is the Ethereum, Ethereum node is split into two clients, execution and consensus. Execution is what's responsible for running the EVM. Um, and right now, I, this is actually an outdated number. I think it's maybe at like 64%. But 64% uh, si of execution clients run Geth. And the risk here is if Geth has a bug or a vulnerability, now the network at large is at risk. Um, Side note. OK. Uh, now on to some of the good stuff. Um, what are EVM alter alterations? Um, what kind of alterations might we make? Um, and, and who's going to make them? OK, so to start, uh, who is actually responsible for these alterations? Um, so historically, the Ethereum sort of core devs and core contributors were th those who were responsible for maintaining the EVM. Um, and this lasted for, for many years and still persists today. Um, but we also have a number of other blockchains that now live in this universe of the EVM. Uh, and these are layer twos, uh, they are you know, roll ups, and, and they're even layer ones. Uh, so now these are the people who, and developer teams, who are responsible for maintaining the EVM. Um, and we can begin to make alterations, and the natural question is why? Well, one reason why is that the alterations that happen outside of Ethereum core can serve as sort of a test bed of experimentation for Ethereum core itself, for the layer one. Um, and this is a really nice attribute uh, and sort of relationship between L2 and other EVM L1s in which uh, Ethereum core naturally has to be more conservative with how they introduce upgrades and alter the EVM. Whereas L2s um, and, and, and other you know, Ethereum EVM-based L1s, they can be a little bit more aggressive, right? Uh, and try new things out. Um, they can you know, roll things back a little bit more quickly, especially in these permission sort of setups. Um, and we have this really nice sort of like you know, synergy between uh, Ethereum core and, and the L2s. Um, oh, other way. Uh, but we also have uh, the opportunity for these, you know, non-Ethereum core EVM blockchains to begin offering new types of functionality for users and developers. And uh, this is where things start to get really interesting, right? And so when we talk about EVM alterations, uh, which I'm, I'm going to walk through a few, uh, they're not necessarily for e the Ethereum core itself. They're for other blockchains who are running the EVM who can be a little bit more aggressive in innovating on how the EVM actually functions. Uh, and you see here, you know, everybody maybe one day ends up with a slightly different version of the EVM with some baseline standardization. 
Okay, so what are those optimizations? Uh, we have uh, native account abstraction, uh, parallelized execution, asynchronous communication between uh, two independent state machines, ZK optimizations, and, and a few more. Um, so uh, native account abstraction, this is probably, I mean, wh who's heard of native, or who's heard of account abstraction? Okay, yeah, so this is like one of the most, you know, popular, exciting new technologies that come out of sort of the last cycle, uh, if, you, if, we're, if we're back, which looks like we're back. Um, and this is, has huge promise for improving the user experience. Uh, we can eliminate seed phrases, replace verification with biometrics or, or social recovery mechanisms. Uh, we can have sort of shared recount, uh, accounts. Um, we can uh, give and delegate authorization of smart contracts to interact with other smart contracts on a user's behalf. Um, and, and broadly speaking, we have a bit more of a robust foundation to improve security of, uh, of, of wallets. Um, now, why might we want to enshrine this into uh, Ethereum, uh, the EVM itself? Um, number one, there's, there's certainly some gas efficiency that we can squeeze out. Um, now, it's not huge, um, but it's there. Uh, and, but the big one is code bug risk, right? If um, we have a variety of different implementations of account abstraction, um, you know, we're introducing with every sort of nuance and tweak uh, sort of a vulnerability surface um, that we then need to audit, right? And so this becomes actually very expensive. Whereas if we enshrine it into the protocol, uh, we, you know, agree on one standard, which might have some coordination overhead, uh, but then we need to audit it once, and it lives there persistently. Um, and this is already underway. Um, there's a, the RIP, which is roll-up improvement proposal, uh, for native account abstraction and, and ZK Sync and Starkware, and I'm sure many others are, are working on this uh, at L2s today. Um, who here has heard of parallelized EVM? Okay, so not as many as account abstraction, but this is another really hot um, area for sort of blockchain infrastructure development. Um, the idea is that we can take the sort of sequential execution of the EVM, which is single threaded and multi-thread it, right? And run uh, the execution of transactions in parallel. And this, you know, holds, you know, some potential for, you know, very significant increases in throughput. Um, it uh, ultimately helps us solve state fragmentation, uh, which I'm not gonna get too deep into, uh, but if we can allow a blockchain, or in particular a layer two, to process more transactions, we actually need less isolated uh, roll-up uh, or L2 instantiations because we can fit it more on a general purpose uh, universal layer two. Uh, and this is well underway. Uh, I think Polygon was actually the first, so you know, shout, shout out to them. Um, but recently Monad and Say, which are uh, sort of EVM, paralyzed EVM L1s, um, have been getting quite a bit of attention. Um, Okay, asynchronous communication. Uh, this is, I think, who, who, who knows what asynchronous communication is? Okay, so we're, 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 <laughs> we're sliding in, 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 in the knowledge set, but the, this is super important. Um, this is essentially core to enabling horizontal scalability. Um, and horizontal scalability is sort of thought of as the most optimal scaling solution for blockchains because uh, we can scale by not increasing the hardware requirements of a particular node, but rather adding new nodes to the system of interest. Um, and we need asynchronous communication between these nodes that are essentially independent uh, state machines or independent instantiations of the EVM to communicate. And today, the EVM does not have this ability to uh, communicate asynchronously across uh, instantiations. Um, so uh, there's actually been a lot of research that's gone into this from sort of Ethereum core, given their efforts throughout the years for sharding. Um, and this is actually underway at NIL, uh, where we use a provable sharding architecture um, and make some modifications to the EVM to allow for asynchronous communication and thus horizontal scalability. Um, 
finally, or I think we've got uh, maybe a, a list of miscellaneous uh, alterations, but ZK optimizations, right? Um, who here has heard and agrees ZK is the end game? Yeah. Um, so uh, ZK is you know, incredibly important for scaling. It's also very important for privacy. Um, today, the most popular sort of instant implementations of ZK for scaling are rollups, uh, ZK rollups. Those that use the EVM uh, essentially build a collection of ZK circuits which make up a ZK EVM. And uh, those, those circuits actually prove the EVM and then a, and a little bit more essentially encapsulating the entire state transition function of, uh, of, of, a, of an Ethereum blockchain, right? And it, this Ethereum blockchain being a roll-up or any other EVM-based uh, blockchain. Uh, unfortunately, in the EVM and its naive implementation is not very ZK friendly. Um, in particular, one of the biggest bottlenecks is the hash function, which is Kechak. So today, most, and I, I want to say all, but I didn't, I didn't double check. Um, most ZK EVMs uh, actually switch out Kechak for Poseidon, right? And this allows you to uh, sort of decrease proof generation costs as well as proof generation time. Um, we can also, and this isn't really an alteration to the EVM, but we can add alternate VM support uh, to a layer two uh, that's a little bit more snark friendly, uh, a little bit more ZK friendly. Uh, and this is, as I said, pretty much underway at, at every ZK roll-up, ZK L2, ZK EVM project. Um, and then we've got a little bit of time. There's a few other uh, alterations that uh, an L2 might consider. Uh, state size control, uh, so sort of accelerating state expiration and, and potentially vertical trees. Um, and this sort of decreases the requirements of, of storage that a node uh, is, is sort of enforced uh, to maintain. Adding BLS 12.381, which is an elliptic curve that's very common um, or more standardized than actually the curve that Ethereum itself uses. Um, adding uh, uh, SECP 256R1. This is, the, uh, this is used widely in trusted hardware, right? So if you want to do things inside of a trusted uh, execution environment, uh, this is, is a super important addition. And then uh, we can actually just add all new VMs to get all, you know, all together, right? Which, uh, Arbitrum has, has sort of done really great efforts in adding Stylus, uh, which supports WASM. Um, and then, uh, you know, I know we're at ETH Denver, um, and we talked a lot about the EVM, but there are, there are absolutely other virtual machines that hold a lot of merit in improving the execution of blockchains. Um, the, the two here I have listed are, are both sort of Ethereum-based rollups. Um, I think I think maybe Eclipse is now using Celestia, but um, Movement uses the Move VM, um, and this sort of prioritizes security. It's uh, formally verifiable. It also has parallelized execution. Um, Eclipse uh, uses the SVM, the Solana virtual machine. Uh, you know, big benefit of, of parallelized execution and also local fee markets. Um, but uh, I'm, I'm here at my last slide. Um, but I just want to end again on the note that the EVM is, is just fine. Uh, the EVM has the most robust ecosystem of developer tooling. Uh, it has the most robust ecosystem of developers. Uh, and you know, it's maybe been slow to implement some more innovative state-of-the-art um, uh, optimizations because L2s haven't had the opportunity to actually uh, you know, sort of experiment, right? In that you know, they've been focused on just shipping and getting things live. Now the layer two ecosystem around Ethereum actually has a critical mass, right? And, and so now I think is, is really the, uh, the right time uh, for uh, non-Ethereum core EVM-based blockchains to begin experimenting uh, you know, with you know, making the EVM uh, great again. Uh, and that is all. <laughs>